um, or sorry, not this one, I'm thinking of another flower. This is a blood root, the, the uh, roots of the flower were actually used for uh, war paint for by the, the Cherokee. Um, they're extremely delicate. The whole flower is maybe three inches across, maybe for a big one. Um, and one little gust of wind will blow the flowers, blow the petals off the flower. So um, when they come out first thing in the morning, we try to photograph them by the end of the day. A lot of times the, the flowers are, are not looking so good. Um, but you can see this, that even at F11, the ends of the petals aren't crisp sharp. The inside is, and that's what I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, but where F11 would give you a lot of depth of field for a portrait, a lot of depth of field for a landscape with a longer lens close to the camera, you're not going to get nearly as much. Like I said, that's what I want you to kind of pay attention. Um, this one at F32, and again, F32 at uh, for a landscape, every th single thing in the picture would be in focus from two feet in front of the camera to infinity. But when we're focused, you know, six or eight inches away from the lens, you don't get that much depth of field. So the background is already going soft, even though it's only a few feet away from the, uh, from the flower. Um, that's a Rue anemone, again, F11. A um, little more depth of field because I'm a little bit farther away. Actually, maybe not, but still only, you know, half an inch of depth of field. So um, I like to start with some of the technical stuff, one, to get it out of the way, but two, to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, talking about things. So macro, traditionally macro means one-to-one, -one, means life-size reproduction. You'll hear that term a lot with when people talk about macro. Uh, and what that means is that the lens is capable of reproducing the subject or focusing the subject on the center in the camera or film at life size. So that the, the image that hits your full frame sensor, which is an inch by an inch and a half or pretty close to it, um, APS-C, shouldn't have said these, uh, is about an inch by two thirds of an inch, something in that range. Um, and micro four thirds is about a quarter of the size or half the dimensions of a um, of full frame. But what's focused on that sensor is the same size as it is in real life. That's a true macro lens. That's what we mean when we say one-to-one. -one. We're not talking about reproduction uh, on the screen. We're not talking about reproduction in the back of the camera, even when you can blow up the, the image, uh, or obviously not a print, because um, that's the reproduction or, of, uh, or the enlargement based on the quality of the file to begin with. But we're talking about what the lenses are capable of doing. Uh, an ordinary lens, a standard kind of lens, uh, is generally capable of about one to five or one fifth or 20% reproduction, meaning that the subject is reproduced at about 20% um, of its actual size, maybe a quarter. You'll see some lenses do that. Um, manufacturers start to put the term macro on lenses though, when they're capable of something around one to two or one to three, a half life size to a third of life size, you'll start to see that term macro. So look in the, st in the stats for the, the lens on the manufacturer's website, um, talk to the folks at Kenmore Camera and ask them what lenses are really capable of doing if you're looking for a lens that's capable of one to one. Um, there's no right or wrong here. You don't necessarily need a lens that can reproduce life size um, if you're shooting larger subjects, okay? Um, it's all about magnification. The closer you get to the subject, the farther the lens extends to get that subject in focus. Um, so the more magnification I have, the more the longer the lens is. Maybe internal, you may not see it move, but the optical elements inside are moving farther and farther away. Um, in to the extent that at one to one, any lens has its focus group twice as far from the sensor as it was when it was in, at infinity. And that's why a standard lens, an ordinary lens can't do uh, macro by itself because the optical elements can't extend that far. That's just not designed to be able to do that. And that's one of the reasons that macro lenses tend to be maybe a little bit longer than another lens of the same focal length or they extend longer because they need to do that in order to get to, uh, to macro, to one-to-one. -to -one. Uh, again, one of our older lenses, this is with the 50, um, that is just about one-to-one -one, um, full reproduction. You can see at F16, I've only got a blueberry in focus, um, about that much depth. <clears throat> Uh, this is an orchid, obviously, but this is a constructed image. Uh, and by that, I mean, it's a real uh, flower. Uh, I bought it at the, the grocery store, but it's a real orchid. The background is artificial. The light is artificial. We'll talk about that a little bit here. 
um, as we go through some of this, but um, basically the background is, I think that one was 16 by 20 um, print out of a, an inkjet printer and then put on a poster board. If you take a picture of some clouds, some trees, some grass, some other flowers, uh, um, whatever you can imagine, take it out of focus, take it in a computer and blur it even a little bit more, just a nice Gaussian blur, print it out of your inkjet printer. You can prop it up behind your subject. You can clip it up, um, whatever, uh, an easel, uh, all sorts of things you can do to, to put that behind the subject. Um, and for a flower that's you know a few inches tall, um, something that's 11 by 14 or 16 by 20 is perfectly sufficient for a background. Um, so you can set this up in your living room, even when it's pouring down rain outside, or if you live up in Minnesota or Canada or some of the other places that I saw, and you've got a foot and a half of snow on the ground, you can still do macro photography inside. Um, I'll give you one trick with lights. We'll talk about lights uh, when we talk about equipment as well. But one quick trick with lights is anytime we use, most of the time we use artificial lighting, we're trying to reproduce daylight. So if you keep that in mind, things generally aren't as nice backlit. Sometimes it works, but generally we light from the front, but we don't look good when the light is shining straight at our face, right? Neither do flowers. So if we imagine something that is off about 45 degrees, illuminating the subject um, at an angle, you'll get a little bit of <clears throat> uh, shadow on the subject. Um, the softer the light, the bigger the light is in app apparent to the, the subject, the softer the light will look. So if you look on this, you can see shadow, but it's not a hard edge shadow. A single light bulb, like a one LED, one flashlight, something like that, will cast very hard shadows. The sun casts hard shadows if there's not a cloud in the sky because it's a very small light source in relation to the subject. It looks small, right? Obviously, we know it's not. But um, like I said, I'll come back to the constructed elements. Um, sometimes macro doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. Sometimes you don't need a true macro lens. This was done with the 100 to 400, um, and it's somewhere around a third life size, uh, what it's capable of doing. But the nice, the advantage to a lens like that is I can be a greater distance from the subject and still get really close. <clears throat> uh, you'll see an image in here later on with the, the 150 to 600 as well. Um, so for this kind of thing, they're going to fly away if I get too close to them. So being able to stand back a few feet gives me a lot better opportunity to photograph um, bugs and things like that that might otherwise um, fly away. So what do we do with macro lenses? The, the first one is pretty obvious. I mean, that's what I've been talking about, but it, overwhelmingly in all the presentations that I've done, all the macro classes that I've taught, when I ask this question, that's by far the number one uh, response. Um, bugs, definitely the second. The others may not necessarily um, be, be as apparent, but food photography, uh, things in the macro range with a little bit of close focus capability are very appropriate for food photography, uh, for stamps, for coins, um, any kind of collectibles where you're trying to document uh, a hallmark or a serial number or something like that. Um, they can be useful for that kind of thing. Portraits is one that a lot of people don't think about, but most macro lenses are normal to long, to slightly long, um, telephoto, if you will. Um, they are very, very sharp. They're generally 2.8 aperture lenses. They're really great at portraits. Um, so it's something else that you can do with your 70 or 90 or 105 millimeter macro lens to take pictures uh, of people as well. 20, 30 years ago, Things that were great close up may not have been as sharp at a distance, but um, these modern lenses, macro lenses today are, are sharp throughout the entire range. I don't think you'll find uh, any issue with that as, uh, at all. <clears throat> um, art reproduction, macro lenses, again, they're slightly long, so they don't have the distortion that could be inherent in some wide angle lenses. Um, they tend to be flat field, so they focus very, very well. Um, they tend to be very rectilinear. Uh, so again, a 50, 60, 70 millimeter macro lens is quite often an appropriate lens for, uh, for reproduction work, um, for artwork or, or other pictures or whatever else you might be doing with it. Um, so there you go. Uh, currency, uh, and again, 
there's no reason that I needed to shoot that at f8 I could have opened up but because um, it's flat but there is some surface deviation so you want a little bit of depth of field just to make sure that you cover those kinds of things <clears throat> um, this is my lesson in pay attention to your surroundings fortunately not in a bad way uh, I was at a trade show at an event and everybody else had gone to classes so I was sitting there by myself working on some email and I turned around and this guy's just sitting on the window behind me. So um, he was very gracious to, to wait while I grabbed the camera and a macro lens uh, and turned away, turned around and took his picture before he flew away. Um, and again, this one does need some depth of field. It doesn't seem like it would, but that close at something very close to one to one, uh, more than one to two anyway, uh, you really need a little bit of depth of field when those stamps uh, curl up and stuff like that. So the lenses from Sigma that we offer uh, currently, and then, like I said, I'll try to remember to talk about some of the other ones out there as well. Um, but you'll find that these focal lengths are very typical of, uh, of macro lenses in general. So we make a 70 millimeter macro lens. That's this one here. Uh, DG means it's a full frame lens. Uh, it was the first uh, macro art lens. Um, it is available for Canon SLR mount, which works very well on, on their adapter, uh, the EF to R adapter. Sorry, there's so many adapters out there. I have to try to remember which one it is. Uh, and we make that natively for, for Sony E mount as well. Um, and L mount, I suppose, as well. The 105 macro, um, the new 105, uh, this is the art. Uh, the DG again, full frame DN, meaning that it was designed from the ground up for mirrorless cameras. So it's only available uh, for L mount uh, and E mount. Aaron can correct me if I'm wrong about that one, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, and then the original 105 or the previous 105 was the EX. That was our designation, kind of like art. Um, that, those were our top of the line lenses. That's available for Sony, or for, sorry, for Canon, for Nikon uh, SLRs. Again, works pretty well on their adapters, uh, on the, their mirrorless cameras as well. Uh, DC, our designation for crop sensor cameras. Uh, we make an 18 to 200, an 18 to 300, a 1770. Those are all uh, DSLR lenses for Canon and Nikon. Um, and they're all in that one to three, one to 2.8, one to 2.9 kind of range. Um, the 18 to 300, we make a dedicated diopter, which is a magnifying filter. We'll come back to those. Um, but it takes the 18 to 300 down to one to two. Uh, so that's a, a nice option if um, you have that kind of camera. So other lenses in this uh, kind of standard macro lenses, you'll, you might find, I think an, another manufacturer makes a 40. Um, I know there's some 50 and 60 millimeter macro lenses. That's about as short of the kind of traditional macro lenses you're going to find. Uh, we have made some 150s over the years, a 180. There are a few other companies that make uh, 200 millimeter macro lenses. And you might ask why there's such a range of macro lenses uh, of focal lengths. And we'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, then you get into some really random things. There are some um, actually fisheye macro lenses, like a 14 or a 15. There's some ultra wides, uh, 20, 21 millimeter macro lenses that just enable more closer focus. Um, you have to consider the field of view when you're shooting for something that wide. Um, and again, we'll talk about uh, why you'd pick macro lenses. Uh, I'm not aware of anything uh, true macro over about 200 millimeters by itself. There are accessories that will enable more macro capabilities out of lenses that may not have as much. Uh, and we'll talk about that kind of thing as well. Um, so, all right. There we go. Uh, this is a flower called a yellow trillium. They're called trillium because they're three of everything. Um, three leaves, three petals, um, three stamen, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, they're really beautiful. Sometimes they open a little bit. Those three petals in the middle will open up a little bit. Sometimes they stay kind of closed uh, like they are there. Um, I just, different kind of look. I decided to photograph down on something and make it more graphic uh, than a traditional photograph of, of that kind of trillium. Well, 
um, this is hibiscus, and this is in a garden uh, in Nashville, actually. And no, I didn't fake that, although I will tell you how to do it. Um, that really, no pun intended, um, that really is uh, first thing in the morning. This is like 7.30, 8 o'clock, uh, first light. Uh, and the morning dew had collected on the flowers. Uh, but how to do that, uh, preferably not someone else's garden, definitely not in state parks and national parks and stuff like that. But if you have flowers in your backyard, if you go to the garden center or the grocery store and you bring them home and you wanna reproduce this, you can go to a drugstore, probably just about any drugstore, buy a bottle of glycerin. You can mix that about 50-50 with water, put it in a spray bottle and shake it up and you can spritz uh, morning dew on your flowers. And it's a lot more viscous than regular water. It won't just run off, run off the flower. It'll kind of beat up like this. Uh, it's an old product photographer's trick. We even used to use toothpicks and pure glycerin to put drops of water water um, on a Coke bottle or something like that that was supposed to look like it was beaded up with sweat. Um, you can use clear corn syrup, although I don't recommend it if it's not something that you're going to just throw away, uh, especially if it's inside because it's going to attract all sorts of bugs. So keep that in mind. But in a pinch, clear, clear corn syrup will work as well. Uh, this is the one I was or started to mention before. This is a, a flower called a trout lily. And this is the one, there are two schools of thought or two theories as to why this is called a trout lily. Um, this one doesn't really have a lot. Some of them have a lot more of those little spots on the petals. Uh, and I've heard people tell me, say that they look like a rainbow trout um, with all the little speckles on them. Uh, the other is, um, I have a Cherokee friend who's told me that these bloom when the trout start to spawn in the spring. Uh, and that's why they call them trout lilies. But the, the entire flower, the petals are just about an inch tall. Um, so the whole flower from the tip of the petals to the tip of the stamen and the pistils might be two inches, maybe. Um, probably not even quite that. They're really small little flowers. They tend to be very, very low to the ground. The whole plant's only four or five inches tall. Um, so I had walked around for years trying to find a flower with a nice background because they tend to be right next to a lot of other things. There's lots of debris and all that kind of stuff. So it's always a challenge to find an interesting flower in the wild anyway, in a great location to photograph it. So I'm always looking for both of those things, um, not just walking around trying to find the perfect flower. So I said, I'd get back to some of these things um, before like all else being equal, why wouldn't we pick the smallest, lightest, least expensive macro lens, right? Um, and there's a reason that you might not want to do that um, or that you might not want to just pick a particular focal length. Um, the first is what's known as working distance. So any true macro lens, like I said, is capable of reproducing the subject life size, one to one reproduction. Well, so a 50 millimeter macro, if it's true macro, all the way up to a 200 millimeter macro lens is capable of reproducing the subject the same. What's gonna be different though is how far from the subject the front of your lens is gonna be. The manufacturer will tell you uh, min minimum focus distance or close focus distance. That may or may not be helpful. Those, those measurements are given from the sensor in the camera. Um, if you can see this behind me on here, the sensor in the camera is where it's measured, not the front of the lens. And you can see on a big lens like this, that's a big difference. But even on a macro lens, that could be six or eight inches difference from the manufacturer's specification of minimum focus distance or close focus distance to what I call working distance. And that's not my term, it's kind of a common thing, um, meaning the distance from the front of the lens to the subject. But basically all else being equal, Every time you double the focal length, you should be doubling the working lit, uh, working distance as well. Um, so, and I'll give you a chart for that in just a second. The second though is gonna be angle of view. So 50 millimeter lens on a full frame camera sees approximately 45 degrees. It's a little bit of variation, but it's gonna see basically 45 degrees. That's half of a right angle. So if you have a lot of things in the background or the subject is, the background is a long way behind the, the subject, you might see a lot of background that might be good. There might be some beautiful flowers uh, in the background or some leaves changing or whatever that the case may be. There also, it also could be that there's a lot of debris, uh, a lot of clutter, a lot of twigs and whatever else, and you don't wanna have to go and clean all that stuff up. So a longer focal length will give you the same subject, but at a much narrower angle of view. So I can eliminate a lot of the background just by shooting with a longer macro lens. 
<clears throat> stabilization. Before mirrorless cameras, I would say you need to have stabilization built into a macro lens because there are going to be times that you're going to try to handhold it. Um, you may shoot most of the time on a tripod, but when you don't, um, that extra stabilization is going to come in really, really handy. Today with mirrorless camera bodies, they almost, as far as I know, all of them do. Well, it's not true, but almost every mirrorless body has some sort of stabilization built into it. So the lens doesn't necessarily have to have the stabilization if the camera body does, but it's nice to have something in, uh, in the system to help you shoot longer exposures. And I'll show you an image with that in just a second. Um, then the size, the weight, the price. Like I said, all else being equal, we'd buy the smallest one, we'd buy the lightest one, we'd buy the least expensive one, but also, um, some of the bigger macro lenses, the old 180 that we had, it's one of my favorite lenses I've ever used. It was just unbelievably sharp. It's bigger than any, any 70 to 200 you've ever seen. Um, and it weighs, I think, three and a half pounds, something like that. It's a lot. It's a big lens. It weighs a lot. But it also takes up the space of two normal lenses or two average lenses in my camera bag. So I had to make a, make a, a decision. Am I going to leave my 1424 at home? and just take that 180. Uh, and if I do, then I can't photograph landscapes and waterfalls or whatever else. So sometimes there's a trade-off with um, those bigger lenses. And then what else can you do with the lens? I like whenever I, I don't know, maybe this is just justification on my part, but when I buy a piece of equipment, I like to think about what else I can do with it. So am I gonna shoot portraits with this? Am I gonna shoot uh, food with this or whatever else? Um, so that may, might influence the macro lens you buy, knowing what else you could use that lens for. Um, notice on this F22, and I just have the tip of that fern in focus uh, and a little bit of the, the petals or leaves, whatever you want to call them, uh, I guess they're leaves, uh, going up on the fern. This is uh, my lesson in patience. I probably took 50 pictures of this. There was just enough wind uh, that morning that the flower would rock back and forth. And every time it moved, it moved a little closer and a little farther away. So I kind of had the time images, uh, photographing it when it was in the right place, uh, hold my breath and hope the wind would die down and take another picture. And then I try to experiment with these kinds of things. I don't know that 22 is gonna get me exactly what I want. So a lot of times I'm gonna shoot this at 11, 16, 22, 32. Um, and I know the lens doesn't have 32, that's a Nikon thing. Uh, I'll try to get back and talk, to, talk about that when we talk about apertures. Um, I'll apologize. I don't know my, my butterflies very well at all. Um, this was in a butterfly garden in Albuquerque. No, Phoenix, sorry, outside of Phoenix somewhere. Uh, and I don't remember the name of it and I apologize to the owners of it. It's a great place. Um, a trick with bugs, butterflies included. They're cold blooded. So if the temperature is cooler in the mornings, they tend to be very, very sluggish. Um, I've even seen bees asleep on flowers. Literally, they kind of hibernate overnight when it's really cold. Um, so they're a lot easier to photograph and not a lot less likely to, to try to fly away on you. Um, this is a flower called a Dutchman's Britches. Um, there are three plants that look identical to each other. There's probably more, but uh, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, there are three plants that are almost indistinguishable until they bloom. Uh, Dutchman's Britches, Squirrel Corn, and Bleeding Hearts. I have that right. Um, and this is one of those three. The bottom of the flowers are almost identical. It's the top portions of the flowers that, are, that kind of distinguish it. Uh, and you'll notice that this is at F8. This is one where I wanted very limited depth of field. I just wanted that front flower in focus, and I wanted the depth of field to fall off as they went back. So I chose a, a much smaller aperture, much wider aperture, smaller number, uh, in order to get less depth of field on an image like that. So I told you I'd come back to working distance. Uh, like I said, it's different from close focus distance or minimum focus distance in that it's measured from the front of the lens, not from the sensor in the camera or the film plane in the camera. Um, I set up a bunch of different lenses. Every lens that we made, um, true macro and otherwise, uh, I set up um, other, some other lenses from other manufacturers and I've tested others over the years. And what I have found is, and this comes down to physics, there's a reason that they are, but they're, they're very, very similar. Almost any lens that's a 50, 60, 70 millimeter lens is gonna have basically two to three inches of working distance from the front element 
uh, or the front of the lens to the subject when they're focused at infinite or in focused at one to one or true macro, which is their closest uh, focus distance. So uh, the and our 70 millimeter lens was about two and a quarter, the original. Um, and this one's close to that because this extends uh, as well. So it's, it's almost the same. The 90 to one to five millimeter macro lenses are gonna be in that five to six inch range. Um, our original 105 was 5.15. Um, I'll be honest with you, I actually haven't tested um, the new one, um, but it, again, it's gonna be in a very, very similar place. When you move up to a 150, uh, our 150 was seven and a half inches and our 180 was 8.75 inches. So you can see trying to photograph things that are very, very small at true life size, a short macro lens can be a very, very difficult thing. It can be very, very challenging because um, you're right on top of it. You might scare it away. You might block um, the light. Um, you might be casting a shadow on something, whatever. Um, the other end is, is true as well, though. Um, when the 180 came out, I decided I would just carry that around all, for a day and I'd leave the other macro lenses that I had at home. And what I found is trying to photograph a flower, um, a fire pink, which two of them was, you know, three or four inches tall. I was almost on the other side of the trail where the trail dropped off. Um, and I could barely, like I had my camera propped up tripod on the edge of the trail and I had to lean over to see the back of the, uh, the camera in order to photograph that a couple of feet away. So when you're photographing larger things, a longer length, a longer focal length macro lens could actually be a detriment. Um, there's a reason though, the other reason that long lenses like the 180s and the 200s uh, macro lenses that are out there exist is for bug photography in particular, or that's one of the things that um, they tend to get used for a lot because you can be a much greater distance from your subject and still photograph something at two or three times uh, life's, or sorry, a half or a third of life size. Um, you'll notice that's F8, that's not a lot of depth of field, but the subject is parallel to the sensor, right? I'm photographing this way, the sensor is here, the subject, the wings are straight up and down. So I don't need a lot of depth of field in order to get that in focus. You can see the corner, the bottom left corner of the frame, the bark on the tree is actually going out of focus. So there's really not much depth of field, but I can use it very efficiently and photograph wide open. Um, I can get faster shutter speeds. I can get lower ISOs where, I, where, where it's possible um, because I don't need a lot of depth of field. If they open up the wings, then I need a lot more depth of field if they're across from going away from the camera. If I photograph down and the wings are pointing toward the lens, I need a lot of depth of field. When the wings lay flat parallel to the sensor, I don't need as much depth of field. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's all about trying to efficiently use the settings on the camera so we're not shooting at you know, 12,000 ISO all the time. Uh, this is a flower called a purple hepatica. Uh, and again, F22, and I've got the front focus, uh, front, front flower in focus. Uh, and the back one is just soft, but recognizable in shape. I didn't want that completely blurred out, but I didn't want it nearly as sharp. I wanted it to be um, separated from the two by focus. And then I wanted the background to be really soft. Um, this is one I stole from Aaron, uh, or that he was nice enough to, uh, to loan to me. Love the images. The, the colors are absolutely gorgeous. And I do not know my dragonflies slash damselflies uh, as well. Um, so I don't know if he knows what that one is. We put him on the spot. Uh, so other than the camera, other than the lens, what do we need uh, for macro photography? Um, and this is one I'll actually back up. We never really talked a lot about the camera, but the, any camera is capable of the shutter speeds that are necessary to do macro photography. Um, the sensor size, there are actually some advantages and disadvantages to different formats for macro, but they're kind of a wash. Um, some people prefer smaller sensors um, because the equivalent lens will give them more depth of field, um, but then you're using smaller pixels. So like I said, I, I think it's kind of a wash, um, but this is one where the newer cameras with better ISOs are gonna be cleaner if you have to shoot high ISOs, but otherwise, the rest of this equipment will probably make more difference in your photography and your macro photography uh, than the camera body itself will. So having a good macro lens, uh, a good tripod, probably 95% of the time that I'm shooting macro, I'm on a tripod. 
uh, unless it's bugs. Uh, just being able to take the camera out of my hands, eliminate that shake, whether it's inside, whether it's outside, um, I can get the composition exactly how I want it to be. Uh, and like I said, I can eliminate that shake. So a nice solid tripod. I'm a fan of Arca Swiss. Uh, again, if you're not familiar, um, go talk to the folks at Kenmore, but it's just a, a standardization for the plates uh, that go in the top of the camera. Or sorry, on the camera in the top of the tripod head. One of the reasons for it, I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is an L bracket on the bottom of the camera. Um, so it usually stays on my camera. That one has one on there, on there as well. So I can put the camera in horizontally. I can put the camera in vertically. I don't have to tilt the whole tripod head so the camera's off to the side of the, the tripod and making it less stable. Um, I also don't change my orientation very much going from horizontal to vertical, my lens stays in a very similar place rather than shifting all the way off to the side, which means I have to move the, the tripod back over and whatever to get the flower in focus again. Uh, cable release, big fan. Uh, the last thing in the world you wanna do with macro is push your finger down on the button on the camera. You're going to shake the camera. Um, so having some sort of cable release, totally uh, a, a individual personal preference thing. Um, I, this one has a, a one that just plugs in. So does that one. Uh, I like things that don't need batteries because I don't have to remember extra ones. Some people like wireless releases. Um, so they don't even, you know, tug on the camera, uh, or they can be farther away, use it for other things. It's great. Whatever works for you. If you don't have one, consider the timer. Um, but here's my lesson in using the timer. There was a time that I forgot my cable release and I thought, no problem, I'm gonna use the self timer in the camera. And I'd set up the camera and there'd be a little gust of wind, but I'd get it all set up, get the composition the way I wanted, get the focus where I wanted and push the button. And in five seconds before the thing counted down or two or three seconds or whatever it was, a gust of wind came in and pff, the flower just shook. Uh, and I just got a nice blurred picture. So it can be challenging for macro outside. If you're in your living room, fine, use your self timer. Uh, it'll work just fine. Long lens plate, it's just a uh, camera plate, a tripod plate that's longer than a normal one. Uh, if you have a lens that has a foot on it, you can use a long plate and you can actually slide the entire camera forward or backward. Otherwise, you can mount it in the tripod socket and mount it forward under the lens instead of across the bottom of the camera. And again, you can slide the whole camera forward or backward change your magnification, change your point of view perspective a little bit. Um, just a little cheaper than using macro rails, but they're not geared as well. So there's some, again, always a trade-off. Lights, um, macro flash, that was the one that Sigma made. Uh, I'll show you an image with it in a second. Useful, big, took up a lot of space. Um, they're a little bit smaller now because most of them are LED. That was a true flash. Uh, any kind of LED panels, I apologize, I just got back from a workshop and my um, bag is all packed up. I have two little LED panels uh, from a company called Photix. Uh, there are a dozen companies that make indistinguishable products. I shouldn't say that exactly, but very, very similar products. So um, I don't think the brand is as critical, but uh, they're about the size of a cell phone and they're an LED panel. They go from daylight to tungsten so I can warm something up or cool it down. Most of them today are RGB. I don't think you'll ever need the red, green, and blue um, colors, but maybe you do. Uh, but that's what I carry around the most now for macro because it's a bigger light, so it's softer instead of a little tiny point light source. Um, they're very bright. Um, I can use one all day, sometimes two or three days and not even need to charge it up again. Uh, I used to carry around flashlights, but like I said, I, I find that I carry those little LED panels uh, most of the time. Five or 10 years ago, those LEDs were had AA batteries in the back of them, so they were big and thick and took up a lot of space. Today, I can slide one in my back pocket and not even think about it. Um, reflectors are nice to have. I like little five-in-ones. Uh, that is usually silver, gold, uh, black, white, and then the inside panel itself is translucent, so it's a diffuser. Uh, you can use them a lot of different ways. You can hold them between the light source and the subject so it's softening the light or diffusing the light. Um, you can use the black to absorb light, the white to bounce light, um, the silver or the gold to reflect light. You can even use the white or the black as a background. Um, you can use them just outside of the image to, to help block wind. Um, 
one word of advice on that is don't buy a giant one. One, you don't want to carry something that's this big when it's folded up, hiking down a trail to find some wildflowers. Um, the other is your subject's only this big. You don't need a diffuser that's three feet tall. Um, the other thing is the wind will grab it out of your hands and it'll go sailing away. So just anything that's, you know, even a foot on the small side, maybe 18 inches or two feet on the big side um, is perfectly sufficient for macro. If you already have something bigger than that, by all means use it. But um, close-up filters, again, like I said before, we make a, a diopter, which is a close-up filter or magnifying filter. Um, that's all it is. It's the lens that goes on the front of, the, of your lens, screws in the filter thread. So you have to buy one for different sizes, for different lenses. Uh, some of them are universal, some of them are dedicated. Uh, you'll find that the better ones are the ones that are dedicated or the ones that are really well designed and well made. Um, I've seen some really atrocious results with really cheap lint filters and I've seen some great results with, with good filters. So um, it's something that you can use to get mac uh, more macro capability out of a lens that may not necessarily be a true macro lens. Um, that's our 180. You notice the ant up there on the top. I sat there for a couple of minutes waiting for, for him to get to that position. Um, that is a type of orchid. It's just a wild orchid. I don't know exactly what it's called, but uh, pink lady slippers. We are fortunate if we hit the timing right in the Great Smokies. Um, there are consistently two types of lady slippers. Um, and this is a type of orchid. It's a wild orchid. These are pinks and then there's also a yellow. Um, I've heard rumors of a third variety, but I think it's just a hybrid of one of the two. Um, I've never seen any conclusive evidence of, of that third variety in the park, but um, you'll notice this one was done at a 15th of a second. This is the only day, or this was the only day that I've ever been outside photographing flowers that there really was truly no wind at all. Uh, and we really could photograph at a 15th of a second. So the ISO could be nice and low. Um, the aperture, I played around with this a lot because I wanted that front flower to be really, really sharp. I wanted the front group to be um, sharp, recognizable, but I wanted the background to be just soft, soft, but just to the point that you could tell that there were some other flowers in the background as well. Um, so out of the ones that I photographed, that's the ones that I, I like the most, but um, Anyway, magnolia, uh, again, in a, a garden uh, outside of a, of a house. Um, just one of the, I think every macro photographer or every flower photographer has to have a magnolia uh, in their image somewhere, at least if you're down here. I don't know if you have magnolias up in the Northwest. I'm surprised sometimes when I travel around the country and, and learn uh, what other things are in other parts of the country. Um, for instance, the first time I was in Phoenix sitting eating breakfast at a hotel, I saw hummingbirds fly out the window and had no idea there were hummingbirds in the desert. Silly me, I learned. Um, so other accessories, uh, real quick, because these aren't gonna be nearly as uh, uh, whatever common. Um, there are things called extension tubes. If you remember when I talked about the very beginning, what macro, what makes macro a true macro, uh, or what makes a macro lens a true macro lens, and that's just extending the elements, the focus group and the lens farther from the sensor than an ordinary lens might be able to do. Well, if you could somehow take the lens off the camera and push it farther away, the lens could do it, but you'd have light coming in. So you need something that just basically extends the lens from the camera, but blocks the light. Uh, and those exist, they're called extension tubes. They are made for literally any camera mount um, that has ever been made in the history of photography. I'm amazed when you look at uh, catalogs of extension tubes, you can find things for 50 year old cameras and they're still set um, available somewhere. Um, they're generally two types, one with electronics, one without, uh, especially for the SLRs. Make sure you get the one with electronics. Most aperture mechanisms don't work without uh, electronics in the body. Uh, if you're going to use autofocus, you need that um, communication through the body as well. Um, they work better with shorter macro lenses because you're getting a greater increase in uh, the focal length. If I pour, put those on a 180, I might get another third or half of life-size magnification. If I put them on uh, a 50 millimeter lens, I get up about two and a half or three times life-size. 
Uh, and they usually come, if you buy them in a kit with all three, they come with a little chart that tells you if you put it on this lens, you'll get this much and whatever. And you can use any one, any combination of two or all three of them together. Um, macro rails, nodal rails. You can buy a macro rail for 50 bucks. You can buy a macro rail for $1,000. Uh, they're just, some of them are geared, some of them aren't. Some of them move one direction, some of them move two directions, some of them even move up and down. Uh, some of them are completely automated, completely electronic. Uh, sky's the limit. I don't carry them around. I do have some here and occasionally I'll use them uh, inside, but usually only when I'm doing really, really tiny stuff um, greater than life size where I need really, really precise uh, positioning of the camera. Uh, spray bottle and glycerin I already talked about, how to fake uh, early morning dew. A soft brush, makeup brush, paint brush, but a big one, you know, half an inch or an inch across, you can use to clean out flowers. Uh, save yourself some time in Photoshop or Lightroom later on. Uh, some other things that I use, uh, I can almost reach them. I have regular um, pony clamps, A clamps uh, over there in my basket beside my table here. And I use them to hold up a background, uh, to hold up a reflector. Uh, all sorts of things like that. So they're pretty, pretty useful. Uh, a plamp, that's the thing in the picture. It's short for plant clamp. It's made by a company called Wimberly, who's famous for making gimbal heads, which are usually for long lenses. Um, you put one of the big clamp on your tripod leg or on the edge of a table or a tree or something like that. And the little end holds the stem of the flower uh, to keep it from blowing around in the, lint, in the wind. They're pretty effective. Uh, the newer one, the plant, Two Plamp 2 uh, is a little stiffer and you can actually use it to hold up reflectors and other things like that as well. Uh, the other thing I use is a product called Gear Tie and Gear Ties you can find at most hardware stores. They're like a giant twist die um, that you'd get on your sandwiches or something, but they're rubberized. Um, I like them because I can, you know, wrap one around the tripod leg, wrap one around the flower stem uh, or another product or something else. But then when I'm done, I can fold them up and make them really small and throw them in the back, uh, in the bottom of the camera bag. Uh, we already talked about backgrounds, how to fake uh, an outdoor, outdoor look uh, when you're inside. So just, you know, photograph something, print it out, get it mounted on, on a poster board uh, or mat board or, or whatever, just something rigid that you can hold it up. And again, a clamp, you can clamp the edge of it and the clamp will sit on the table and hold your background up. Uh, you can clamp it to the back of a chair. I've got some bar stools over there. I use those a lot for that kind of thing. Um, and then any kind of indoor light, when you're mixing lights, you wanna make sure that they're all basically the same balance, right? So that they're all basically daylight. Um, most of the lights in here that I use for this uh, type of work are daylight balanced. Um, I could warm them up or cool them down when I need to. Um, so, um, but you don't wanna mix like a tungsten lamp and a bunch of daylight LED panels or something like that, because you're gonna get a really warm light from one and a cooler light from another. If it's all tungsten, that's fine. You can just set the white balance in your camera, which that will lead us to uh, the settings in here in just a second. Uh, this is with and without that ring light, uh, the dual flash that we made, it basically had an LED, or not an LED, sorry, a flash tube on either side. So the first one's without a flash. The second one, there's more light coming in from the left side of the camera into the flower. So light coming across the subject helps to uh, enhance texture, detail. Uh, it helps to light up the inside of that flower because the light's going that direction. The other thing that flashes do or any kind of light on a subject, there's a thing called the, the inverse square law, which basically just says light gets darker the farther it travels, right? I mean, it spreads out. Um, the actual law is um, light falls off with the square the distance from the source, but um, which just means when it doubles in distance, it's a quarter as bright. Um, so if I have a light on my flower that's a foot away, the background that's three or four feet away isn't getting nearly as much light. So when I turn the light on, my exposure got brighter. I decreased the light, whether it's a flash or an LED, doesn't really matter. You can just see it better if it's an LED. Um, I change my exposure so that the subject is then darker and then back to the same exposure as it was to begin with, and that's going to make the background darker still. So people use this technique by throwing lots and lots and lots of light at a subject and not allowing it to hit the background or making the, sure the background is far away, and that makes the background go really dark, um, even black to an extreme. 
not my kind of, of macro photography, but I know a lot of people do that. And, and there's, again, no right or wrong, no judgment, just not the way I shoot things. But if that's what you're looking for, that's a good way to do it. Um, just increase the light on the subject and make sure it doesn't fall in the background. So uh, with extension tubes, that was our 70 uh, with both sets or with all three, a full set of extension tubes on the right. And that's somewhere right around two and a half times um, life size. And you can see even at F16, I basically had the letters in the middle of the Oreo in focus on the right. Um, on the left, X, F16 gives me a lot, uh, a lot more depth of field, but I'm gonna lose some because I'm focusing even closer to uh, the camera, to the subject. Real quick, cause this is an entire um, class unto itself. Um, there's a phenomenon called focus stacking. So in macro photography, there are three things that we can do to get more depth of field. I can increase, uh, turn my aperture higher. So if I go from F5.6 to F11, I'll have twice as much depth of field. For if I don't change anything else, two stops, 5.6 to 8 to 11, I have twice as much depth of field. From 11 to 22, I have twice as much depth of field. But that still might only be a half an inch, and that may not be enough. Um, I can back up. The greater the distance to the subject, the more depth of field I have. Just by changing the focus in the lens, all the settings staying the same, um, I get more depth of field. So I could back up and crop and get the depth of field that I need. The third thing is focus stacking, and that is taking a series of images from the front thing I want in focus to the back thing I want in focus at a much smaller uh, aperture, generally, uh, and then putting together the focus elements uh, when you're back in the computer. Um, and I say that there are a few cameras that will actually restack focus in camera. Uh, the only one I can think of is Olympus. There may be more, and if I've forgotten one uh, or forgotten about or don't know about your camera doing it, then I, I apologize. But um, the D850 that I have on the tripod here it will automate the capture and a lot of cameras will do that now. So in the menu somewhere, there's a stacking, a focus stacking something, and you basically tell it course adjustment, medium adjustment, fine adjustment, how many images do you wanna take? And then you focus on the closest thing and hit the button and the camera will snap an image, refocus and take a picture, refocus and take a picture, refocus and take a picture. Um, the D850 does it in live view, it may do it otherwise, but if you do it in live view, um, the mirror doesn't even have to move. So it's very, very, very quick. It's and you're done. Puts it all in one folder. When I get back to the computer, I open those up. I use a product called Zerene, Z-E-R-E-N-E. -E. Um, I find that the most intuitive, flexible, easy. It's whatever you want to call it, shareware, you can download it and try it out for free. And then you, there's a license for it um, after a month or something like that. Um, but that way you could at least try this out, see if it's something that you want to do before you decide to pay for it. The other one that everybody uses, the most other most common one is called Helicon, H-E-L-I-C-O-N, uh, Helicon. Um, six of one, they're both going to do the job very, very well. Lightroom and Photoshop do in their... Um, compositing, whatever, the same thing that you'd use for, it's called photo merge. Um, the same thing that you'd use for panoramics or HDR or whatever will recombine focus stacking. Um, the algorithms aren't as good and it's gonna leave, uh, a, often leave a ghosting uh, around por portions of the image. So I think you'll find that if you're gonna do this uh, more often, then you wanna use something uh, like Zerine. But um, so the one on the left, single image, uh, F22, eight seconds, and I still don't have the whole flower in focus. The one on the right, I think is 22 images at 5.6, and I could do the math, but it's like a half a second uh, or a quarter of a second. And then I can recombine all those things uh, in the computer and the whole flower is in focus. It is something you wanna do in your living room. It's probably not gonna happen very well outside because uh, if there's any motion in the subject when you're photographing it between the frames, they're not gonna combine very well. Um, and there's another image uh, focus stacked 
there's no way in the world you'd be able to get a fly that's an inch long, um, maybe with a tail slightly more, probably not. Um, with all those hairs coming toward the camera and away from the camera, you would never get all of that in focus in a single image framed like it is. The only way to do that would be at F22 or 32 and a foot away, and then you'd have to crop in half the image or something like that. So, um, so that's focus stacked as well. Okay. Um, like I said, I'd get back to uh, settings. And a lot of times people really kind of hope or, or ask me for like a magic formula. If I could just plug this in the camera, um, what's going to take great images. And if you're going to shoot outside, there are going to be some vari variables, right? Um, the amount of light, the amount of wind, uh, the lens that you're using, the size of the subject, all those kinds of things. So I can give you my starting points. When I pull my camera out of uh, the camera bag, and this actually, this is the FPL from Sigma. Um, this is now my macro camera of choice. Uh, it's 61 megapixels and weighs less than a pound. Uh, full frame sensor. This 105 2.8, the new art lens. Um, that's my preference on a full frame camera. It gives me the best versatility of working distance without being too far away to sometimes or too close sometimes. Um, it's a nice little combination. It's still a, a compact little kit. Um, something is easy to carry around when I'm out hiking or, or whatever. Um, so that being said, the first thing that I'm going to do is set the camera to f11. As soon as I get the camera out, turn it on, just put it on f11. I might go to 16. You can see that sometimes I go up to 22. I might go down to f8. Um, but that's a gen like generally my starting point is, and I'm almost always going to be in that f11 to f16 range. Um, shutter speed again. I'm going to start about 125 with some stabilization um, or on a tripod. 125 is probably enough to eliminate a little bit of breeze, uh, a little bit of motion in the subject from the breeze. Um, if I'm hand holding it. It's a little bit of a stretch with a 105. I might go up to, to 250 or something like that, just to make sure I get really, really sharp images. Um, there are times that I'll go down to 60 or 30 if I can get away with it, because that allows me to turn my ISO lower. Um, there are times that I'll go up to 500 or 1,000. If I have to have a faster shutter speed than that to freeze the motion, it's just not a macro day. I'll go shoot landscapes instead. Uh, ISO then is the third thing. The third part of the exposure triangle um, for macro, for me, it's the least important, right? I need aperture for depth of field. I need shutter speed to eliminate motion. ISO is only there to make sure that I get the proper exposure. Um, again, I'm going to start about 1600. There are plenty of days that I'm shooting at 3200 just because of the wind. Uh, if I can get away with it outside, I'll go down to 800 or even 400. Um, inside, I'm going to stay as low as possible. Keep the camera at its native ISO, 100, 200, 160, whatever your camera's base ISO is, um, you're going to get more color information, less noise, just a better image. Um, again, there are times that I might go to 6400. Uh, and again, if it takes that to get the subject frozen, it's probably not a good macro day. Um, my white balance is almost always in daylight. If I'm inside, I'm using artificial lights, but they're daylight balanced. So I can control the lights to get a little bit warmer or cooler image, and I can leave the camera set in daylight. Uh, and I know how the camera is going to respond. If I make the lights warmer, the record is warmer. If I leave it in auto and I make the lights warmer, the camera will try to neutralize that. If I'm shooting outside at basically 10 or 11 in the morning, one or two in the afternoon, my daylight, or my daylight setting on my camera will be neutral. So white will be white, colors will look the way they do um, naturally. Uh, in the very, very middle of the day, yeah, they're a little bit, colors can be a little bit cooler. If the sun goes behind a cloud, they can get a little cooler. Um, so there are times that I might, um, I'm probably just not gonna shoot at noon. Uh, we're usually out in the mornings and the afternoons uh, to get this kind of, of um, mornings are great because the, the wind is a little calmer anyway, generally. Um, but if my camera set on daylight, those nice warm tones at seven, eight o'clock in the morning will record as warm tones. Uh, and I can clean it up. I can tweak it a little bit in Lightroom or Photoshop, but I'm going to get the warm tones that my eye perceives when we're out photographing uh, early in the morning. 
Uh, I'm always using manual focus uh, for this kind of thing. If you try to do auto, the flower moves a little bit, it'll refocus to a different part of the flower. Uh, doesn't really matter what the focus system is in the camera, whether it's contrast detection or phase detection, uh, a white flower, white petal on white petal is very, very difficult for uh, an autofocus system for a camera to, to focus on. So for all those things, it's just easier to do it in manual and lock it in place. And even if the flower's moving, I'm gonna wait until the photograph or the flower's in the right place and then use my cable release and, and trip the shutter. Uh, if you have some sort of focusing aid in the camera, focus peaking where portions of the image change color to show you it's in focus, by all means use it. So this camera has peaking, the part, parts of the image that are in focus go red. So I use that to put the focus plane exactly where I want it to be. So my depth of field will cover the subject. Uh, the D850 in live view, uh, I can do focus magnification. So I can zoom in to 100%, so I can literally see pixel level uh, and put the focus exactly where I want it to be uh, and then go back out and, and photograph that way. I am using histograms. One more trick on this, um, the histogram number one, if you're not familiar, histograms that graph, um, sometimes it's just that, sometimes it's like this, uh, that shows you the exposure values in an image, blacks on the left, whites on the right. Uh, and it just shows you where the majority of your exposure is uh, in a peak or whatever. The, the first trick with histograms is you don't want them to push all the way up against one edge or the other. Whenever they push up against the edge, instead of just touching the edge, if they actually you know, move toward the edge, you're losing detail on that end. So again, right side, you're losing highlight detail, left side, you're losing shadow detail. If you have to pick one, lose shadow detail. The human eye is much more distracted by um, blown out highlights than it is blocked up shadows. Um, first thing though is that histogram is a measurement of the JPEG that your camera is going to shoot. It's not actually the raw file. The live histogram might be a little bit better um, if you're using one before you photograph. Um, the second though is what you see is an average. It's a composite. It's the, the red, green, and blue values averaged out together. Um, for a normal scene, daylight, landscape, uh, people, whatever, architecture, whatever the case may be, street photography, um, that average histogram is probably fine because you don't have any really, really intense colors. The problem though is if I'm shooting a red flower, my composite histogram might look great so the highlights aren't blown out. When you look at the red, green, and blue histograms separately, Green and blue are probably farther left than the composite looked, and the red could be clipped. When I lose detail in the red channel, my flowers don't look as good. So when I'm doing flower photography, I'm always looking at the red, green, blue histogram, not just the composite histogram. Okay, it's another uh, constructed image. Um, that is a real flower, uh, Columbine, uh, artificial background, one light, Another trick with shadows, look at the where the shadow is and it'll tell you where the light is, light was, right? So if you look on the yellow part of the petal, the red one above it is casting a shadow and it's coming down from left to right as you read the, read the image. So that means my light was up here, the main light was above the, the flower on the left, slightly forward, but a nice 45 degree angle, kind of mimicking daylight. And then I had a reflector on the other side to bounce some lights back into the some light back into the shadow so that I didn't lose detail and the shadows didn't go solid black. Uh, I think I told you there'd be one where ISO really was important and stabilization was important. Um, these guys moved around way too much to try to set up a tripod outside of the terrarium, I guess is what it's called. Um, this is at the um, wow uh, botanical gardens here in Atlanta. Um, and F16, you can see the very back of the frog is just getting soft, front's nice and sharp, so that was acceptable. I didn't want to turn it any higher because I didn't want to lose any more exposure. 50th of a second was as best as I could get to try to handhold this with the stabilization that was in the body of the camera, and it still took me ISO 6400 uh, in order to photograph it. Is there noise in the image? Yeah, absolutely. If you blow this up to 100%, you can see noise. 
Um, is there some loss of color information and image quality compared to shooting something in 100 ISO? Sure. Does it work? I think so. So the answer to a lot of people is that ask, well, you know, why, why would I shoot at 6400? I'm afraid of what happens in the camera. Today's cameras are good, really good. Uh, and the noise uh, correction software, those kind of things. After the fact, um, I use a product called Luminar a lot as well to clean up noise and images. Um, just a little bit better than the way Lightroom and Photoshop does it, in my opinion. Um, it's good. They're all they they're very very effective. So don't be afraid to experiment. Um, this is the shameless sales pitch. Uh, image on the left is just about the entire full frame shot with the 105. Um, this new macro art <clears throat> uh, F16, 20th of a second, so nice still day, 400 ISO. Uh, the image on the right is, I don't even know what, 200% magnification um, uh, or 200% of whatever pixel level, something like that. And you can see how much incredible detail there is in that. This lens is truly phenomenal. Um, it took a lot to get that Nikon out of my hands when I do macro. and the camera really convinced me a lot, but this lens is what, what did it for me. Um, and like I said, this combination to me is the best thing going for macro right now. Um, but that lens, if you've got a, a Sony camera or another L mount camera, um, that 105 macro art is just phenomenal. Um, by far the best macro lens I've ever used. So real quick, leave you with some tips uh, and then we'll take some more questions. Um, this seems, Obvious from what I've just talked about, it also um, does seem a little bit like a sales pitch coming from a lens manufacturer, a camera manufacturer too, but we make a lot more lenses and cameras. The lens is more important than the camera. For macro, this is really, really true. Um, even a basic camera can do some great work with macro, but a basic lens is not gonna give you the flexibility to be able to focus close, to be able to magnify well, to stay sharp, um, all the other imperfections that, that can happen in lenses. One of the hardest things with macro photography is eliminating motion, whether that's the motion in the subject, the motion in the camera, um, wind, whatever that may be. Tripods help, cable releases help, adding light helps, keeping your shutter speeds higher than you might think otherwise um, definitely helps. So that old rule, one over the focal length. So for a 105 lens, I need 125th of a second. If you're, when you're doing macro, you're magnifying everything. You're magnifying the shake of your hands, you're magnifying the motion of the subject. So that rule isn't gonna work. It's gonna take two or three times of that uh, in order to uh, handhold the camera or to be able to freeze any kind of motion, significant motion in the subject. Uh, so uh, this is where stabilization comes into play. So instead of 125, I might need to shoot at 500 without any stabilization in order to handhold the camera. Then with some stabilization in the lens of the camera, I could come back down to 250, 125 maybe even 60 and get away with hand holding. But don't think you can start at 125 and your camera says it has three stops of stabilization and you go down 60, 30, 15. There's no way in the world you're gonna do macro photography handheld at a 15th of a second. Um, maybe with flash, maybe. Um, exposure, macro lenses eat light. That's the way I think about it. That's why I put it in quotes. Um, <clears throat> when I'm at one to one, my camera's losing two stops. I think if you remember back, I think I mentioned something about the way Nikon does things a little differently. Um, so Canon and I think Sony, um, as you lose that light, so I set my camera at F16 and I focus closer and closer and closer, the light coming through the lens is just spreading out. It's not losing light, it's just spread out over a bigger area. So the portion that I'm using that where the sensor is, is just getting less exposure to the extent that it's two stops less at one to one. Canon and Sony will just adjust. So the shutter speed might go from uh, 250 to 125 to 60 just to compensate for that. But the aperture will stay the same because the blades in the lens didn't move. Nikon, for whatever reason, is showing you the effective aperture by that light loss. It will adjust the shutter speed, but it will also change the aperture to go from 16 to 22 to 32. Even though there probably isn't a 32 on the lens, the LCD, the little screen on the top of the camera, will still show you that you're set in F32 because that's the effective aperture after you've lost two stops of light. Six of one. Um, either way, you're losing light. That's the, the, the point there. Depth of field, never enough. We talked about that. Move, move farther back and crop. 
uh, turn your aperture up, focus stacking. The last one here is composition. In all the workshops that I've taught, when we look at images together and we review images together, the number one comment from the participants, not from me, the number one comment is, that's great, why didn't you get in closer? What I find is a lot of people don't know what macro lenses can really do. My suggestion is flip it to manual, turn it all the way to its closest focus, and then move forward until the subject's in focus. Not that you have to shoot that way, but once you know how close you can really get, I think it'll open up the, um, your creativity a little bit um, in order to photograph things in different ways. The other is this is digital. You have the camera, you have the lens, you have the memory card. Try it out. Get closer, get farther away. Shoot up on, above it, below it, beside it. Um, try it at f5.6 all the way to 22. Um, just experiment. Look at them on the screen when you get back to your computer and see what you like and what you don't like, then figure out why. What did you do that you really liked? Try to put that into practice the next time you photograph. What, it, what, what didn't seem to work for you? Try to make sure that you don't do that the next time. So the more you practice, the more you learn, the better your photography will get. Oh, I told you I'd show you this one uh, with a 150 to 600. Um, just, I was shooting over people's shoulders, so I didn't want to make them wait uh, for me to set up a tripod and a, a macro lens. So I decided to see what that lens could do. And um, is it true macro? No, it's not anywhere close to one-to-one, -one, but I'd still put it in the close focus uh, range. So I threw it in the presentation. Okay, uh, some more wild orchids. And that is actually here uh, against this background, uh, natural orchid, artificial light, artificial background, um, warmed up the light on the flowers, changed the color balance in the camera so they were neutral, which makes the background go colder. Does that make sense? Warm up the subject, neutralize the color, the exposure for that, the white balance, makes the background go colder. So I can make gray look like blue. Ha, all right. Let me, um, I wanna jump in here for a second because <laughs> while um, we're recording this before we start into the questions, but apparently Zoom was having some issues with their server and um, we had a whole bunch of people that did not get logged in. So I am going to apologize in this now because you'll get the recording and I'll say I'm really sorry. But uh, we are sending out a recording just to everybody because um, a lot yeah. of people had an issue. So I just wanted to thank them for their patience. Mm -hmm. They'll see it in the recording when they get it, but um, go on with your questions. <laughs> well, I'd, I'll, I'll just add to that. I'm glad the recording worked so that everybody does get at least some. Well, action. yeah, that's the thing is like what tipped me off before my um, coworker came in and, and told me I was, I kept trying to record on the cloud because that's normally what I do because it's easier because these files yeah. are huge um, and it wouldn't let me record. So I was like, what's going on? And then I hit the record on my computer. So anyway, okay. Good. I'm done. Good. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, Aaron, were there any common things or, or questions that came up that you wanted me to, to comment on? Uh, it was a lot of the, the kind of general ones, uh, focal lengths. I mean, stuff that we've already touched on. Um, why, don't we make, why don't we make lenses for Canon mirrorless cameras? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, using non-macro lenses for close focus work. Yeah, um, yeah things I, I think you all, you covered pretty well. Um, if anyone does have any questions that we didn't address during the presentation, now would be a great time to put them out there as we're kind of winding down. Um, yeah, uh, and while we're waiting, a moment, I just can... want to say thank you, Brett, for all that information. Yeah. That was great as always. And Absolutely. thank you to yeah, everyone who joined much. us for the presentation here and watching the recording after the fact. Definitely. Yeah. And I hope everybody can get out and come to our uh, sale this weekend. It's tomorrow yeah. through Sunday. Aaron will be here tomorrow and Sunday and it's a half day on Sunday that's we store doesn't open till 12 but mm -hmm. um definitely come in and check out all the deals and you're all going to get a uh email with all the specials in there with some discounts and stuff because we've got almost everything in the store is on sale so you can get some little led panels for macro photography mm -hmm. reflectors all that stuff is on sale so and uh, I also, if you scroll up, I put a link for our intro to street photography. Um, if you are local and you want to come in and jump in on that, um, go ahead and register. And uh, thank you, you guys, for everything. Um, Absolutely. 
You guys are awesome. Thanks everybody for uh, for attending today. Uh, and we're again, we, we're sorry if, if you didn't get everything today, but you'll get to see the the recording and yeah. and um, and I appreciate all the the great comments. I and and I, I really do appreciate that. I you can tell I think I, I absolutely love macro photography, um, and I really really love photographing flowers. Uh, and I love uh, helping other people get where they want to be. I, it's kind of the way, like I feel, is my mission as a photographer um, and an educator. So mm -hmm. I like the feedback. It makes me feel good that hopefully I'm doing what I what I want to do or what I like to do. So yeah, yeah. All right. Well, again, thanks um, to Sigma. Thanks to Kenmore. Yes. Thank you, Sigma. Thank you, Aaron. And drive carefully on your way up here. <laughs> it looks dry out there so far. We should be good. You got a tiny little window. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brett. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, thank you, guys. everybody. And you're lucky you jumped in and got on because there's a lot of people that didn't. So, <laughs> but uh, watch for the email through Eventbrite. And um, I believe the link i'm not sure we might post it on our youtube but um we'll see that'll be later because it'll take a little while to download yeah. so anyway all right bye awesome thanks everyone bye bye